All right, so I didn't mention this last week, but basically, last week we started, so se chapter 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, the book of Judges. Prior to that, we, we went into the lives and stories of various judges that were famous judges in Israel that, you know, God decided to have those stories recorded and, you know, for things to learn. But from 17 on out, it's no longer any stories of any particular judge. Now we're just going into just other things that happened during the time of the judges. So in, in chapter 17 is where this story started that we're, that we're reading about in chapter 18. Last week we learned all about this man Micah, you know, and who he was, and he's got his house of gods and everything else um, where he's living. And then in, in chapter 18, where we are, the Bible starts off, In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance dwelling. Now, I don't necessarily, I don't think that this necessarily has to be in chronological order from this point forward with the rest of the book of Judges, just because, you know, you're not really going through the succession of, of Judges. You're, you're now just hearing about these different stories. And especially when you see that the Danites hadn't even finished conquering all the land you know that happened for this probably happened earlier in the whole span of the you know 400 years of the judges since the children of israel came out of of egypt right it's a long time frame so we don't know exactly where these events fall i'm just i'm just throwing that out there though just so you be aware and you know when you're reading the bible we have a tendency to think everything's in chronological order and for the most part it is you know generally speaking the bible is organized in a very chronological manner Right, from Genesis in the beginning to Revelation at the end, uh, it, it follows very much a chronological time frame. However, there are times where you're going kind of, you're going forward and then you're jumping back again and covering some more stuff. So I wanted to throw that out there um, as we, we go through this. And then, of course, this story ends in, in chapter 18. And then next week, Judges chapter 19. That's one story that's going to continue till the end of the book of Judges. So, um, but let's, let's dig into this chapter here. So it mentions the fact, again, that there was no king in Israel. And I just want to make a point of this also. God's system of government was designed to have people ruling, but they were, they were judges that were leading now, not ruling in the sense of like, like a king would rule, because God's government, God is supposed to be the king, because he's the lawgiver, he's the ruler, he's the king, but then other people would kind of help and lead and just show the right way and, and uh, just be an overall leader on earth for the, for the children of Israel. And one of the reasons why I think this, this phrase kind of comes up more, like every man did that which is right in his own eyes, and there was no king in Israel. Now, I think this isn't just referring to the fact that there was no physical king in Israel, although that's obvious and apparent. I think the children of Israel, based on these stories that we're reading, didn't consider God to be their king. When you read about here, and we're uh, just a, a brief summary of what we're seeing here in chapter 17, we've, we, we first just hear about one man. Okay, so there's one man out there that he's got into idolatry and everything else. Yeah, whatever, right? There's one person. You can't really ascribe much to that as far as the whole, you know, all the children of Israel. But then we see in this chapter, and I'm going to get into a little bit more detail, it's like the entire tribe of Dan is just all gets involved into idolatry. And when we find out at the end, it's that, they start in idolatry here and it doesn't end until they go into captivity after all of the kings have reigned. Like it's the entire existence practically. They're just got these other priests over them and they're involved in idolatry. And, you know, especially next week when we get into Judges chapter 19 and you hear about what happens with the tribe of Benjamin and how wicked and, and disgusting they've all already fallen in a short period of time. I think these are the reasons why the Bible keeps making mention of there was no king in Israel. Because then by the time you get to 1 Samuel, Samuel is basically the last judge of the children of Israel before Saul is anointed as a king. And God explains to Samuel when they said, no, no, we want a king. We want a king. 
Well, the reason why they wanted a king, because they didn't regard God as their king. And that's why God told Samuel, because Samuel tried to warn him and tell him no, and he was upset that they were, they were wanting to have a king, and they were so foolish. And God said, you know what? Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And that's what, you know, that's what God told Samuel. So he's just like, they don't want me ruling over them, which is why they want to have a king. It's not about you or your sons or anything like that. It's about me. And, that, and that's the way it had been, I think, for quite a while that it finally just came to a head when, when Samuel ended up judging Israel, that they had had enough and, and decided to actually institute a physical king on this earth. But that's, that, that's why I think we keep seeing this phrase come up over and over and over again. That's not merely to let us know that there's no physical king. It's that they don't even regard God as king. Um, but let's, let's, let's start off here again in verse number one. In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. And the children of Dan sent of their family five men from their coasts, men of valor, from Zorah and from Eshdaal, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said unto them, Go search the land, who when they came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, they lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned in thither and said unto him, Who brought thee hither? And what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? So as they're lodging, you know, they're, they're headed to uh, basically what's going to become known as Dan to, to spy out the land because they're going to, if you know the story back from Joshua, they had received their inheritance, but it wasn't enough for them, so they wanted to get more. So this is what they're doing now. They, they already have um, here Eshdaal and from Zorah. They'd already uh, conquered and inhabited those lands, but they needed more land. They needed more space, so now they're going to, to get more. And as they're lodging in Mount Ephraim, because Mount Ephraim is very close to, where, to the land they're going into, and um, they hear this voice. So they hear this priest that Micah had hired for them, and they're like, wait, I know that guy, right? And then they go in, and they're like, what, do you, what are you doing here? You know, what, what brings you all the way out here? How, how is it that you ended up here? And they just start talking to this guy. And um, verse number four, he answers them and says, and he said unto them, thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. And they said unto him, ask counsel, we pray thee, of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. And the priest said unto them, Go in peace, before the Lord is your way wherein ye go. And uh, we're going to get into this priest in a little bit, but uh, basically this guy is just, he's a preacher for money. He doesn't care about what's right, obviously, because he was a Levite that became a priest. Now, we don't know, I don't know, I can't say 100% for sure if he was, you know, of the uh, an heir of Aaron you know that he sh even should be a priest but we see that um, everything he does and says is basically it's motivated by the money oh okay yeah you'll give me all this stuff yeah I'll stay with you I'll be a priest I'll be a father yeah whatever you want you've got this house of gods sure now these other guys come along and you know at first they seem to like wow okay well let's let's ask this Levite let's let's ask of the Lord and that would be the right thing to do. And that's what the children of Israel should be doing. And that's what we should be doing. You know, um, any child of God should be going to the Lord, you know, when you're going to do something big, when you've got a big event, you've got a big battle, you've got whatever going on, go to the Lord first. Just seek the Lord, seek the Lord's wisdom, seek the Lord's counsel before moving forward. And, and this is what they're doing. They're trying to hear from God. But we're going to find out really quickly that, yeah, what looked good on the surface, they were still caught up in the idolatry and everything else too because they're going to go and just steal all of Micah's idols from him and, and just set up this priest to be there. You know, it was, it was no, basically no, they're no different than Micah is. Verse number seven. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people that was therein. How they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure, and there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything. And they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. So now they've made it into their, 
their destination and, and the name of the city is called Laish. And they come across this, this city and they notice that the people there says they dwelt careless. It means they didn't have a care. They weren't worried. It's basically this, oh, this, this self-sufficient community. They don't have business with anybody else. They said they don't have business with the Zidonians. If you know like Tyre and Sidon, the Zidonians had a lot of, of merchantmen and traffic. It was a, a place of a lot of just activity, you know, economic activity. But th where they were, they had everything they needed. They, had, you know, they were living off the land and, and they dwelt carelessly. It says quiet and secure. And there was no magistrate in the land. So basically, I, when I read this, I think of just like this hippie community. Right? Because it's just like this communist little hippie community. Because there's no magistrate. There's nobody. And when it says a magistrate, that's just like a governor or a judge or somebody kind of with authority for the whole town, for the group that can, that can lead and direct and just keep order. And it says here, there's no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything. So this sounds to me is just kind of like anything goes. Right? Which is your, your hippie community, the free love, whatever, right? Don't judge me. We're just fine. And they're dwelling carelessly, not a care in the world. They're off in their own compound doing their thing, right? And it says, and they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. This isolated community have got nothing, you know, no dealings with anyone else. And when I was preparing and studying for the sermon, you know, I'm, I was just kind of thinking about this and, and what this place might look like. And I just could not help but continue to think about just the, this hippie culture and subculture. And that, um, that song came to mind from John Lennon, that, that wicked devil, John Lennon, that was of the Beatles, made a song called Imagine. And this is, this is describing his utopia. It is a super famous song. Probably, most of you are probably familiar with it. If you're not, don't bother looking it up because you don't want to get a, a, a wicked song, a worldly song like this stuck in your head because it is. Look, worldly music can be very appealing to the flesh to listen to. In, in many forms, they say, well, that's not my type of music. It doesn't matter. There's, you know, there's a reason why so many people listen to that music. I mean, the Beatles were so popular, they were so, they were so lifted up in the eyes of their fans that they became extremely proud and haughty and, and basically thought that they were like going to be more popular than Jesus Christ himself. That they were just like going to replace him just, be, just because of how much popularity and, and how much arrogance and pride they had from being so lifted up. But they were really just a bunch of God-hating devils. Here's how that song goes. Just, just, I got a couple um, lyrics here from that song. Imagine it says, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Yeah, that's what he wants you to imagine. First of all, just say, there's no heaven, there's no hell. This wicked atheist, just, just, just imagine if you would. Yeah, like that's a good thing to imagine there's no heaven. Why would you want to imagine there's no heaven? Heaven's a great place. Jesus said he's going to build, make mansions for us that where he is, we may be also. I don't know about you, but I, I want to go to heaven. I think it's a great place. I don't want to imagine that there's no heaven. Now, John Lennon wants to imagine that there's no hell below us because that's where, he's, that's where he is because that's where he was headed when he wrote this song and that's where he is right now. And I'm sorry, yeah, you, you may want to imagine that reality isn't reality, but it doesn't change reality. Yeah, right, that's right. Amen. You could daydream like a fool all day long and pretend like hell doesn't exist, yeah. but it doesn't change the fact that hell exists, that hell's in the center of the earth. Imagine all the people living for today. This sounds just like our careless society here the, that, uh, that the children of Dan are going to go and, and destroy yeah, because just, just living for today, that's what it's all about, right? Feel good. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Yeah, that's another, you know, funny how that gets thrown in there again into this song. 
Imagine all the people living life in peace. So, what sickens me, though, is how many Christians, so-called Christians, will just sing these songs and sing along to it and buy their music and listen to it and just, just let this pump through their mind while they mindlessly repeat words like this. Yeah, imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no hell. Imagine there's no religion, you know, because religion's just horrible, isn't it? Well, the Bible says pure religion and undefiled is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I like pure religion. I don't like false religion, but I like God's religion. I don't want to imagine no religion. I don't want to imagine no heaven. I don't want to imagine no hell. I think they're all great. Because it's the way God made things to be. And I don't want to sing a bunch of lies by some devil that hates God. But I think this story here in this, in this, this, uh, this city is also a picture of what's going to happen in the end times. Keep your place here in Judges chapter 18. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Because what, what do we have in Judges 18, 7? We've got this city of people, just this heathen people. They don't believe in the Lord. They think that everything's fine. They're in peace and safety, right? But what's going to happen? The children of Dan are going to come, up, come upon them, and then it's utter destruction. And they're going to burn their city to the ground. And everything's going to be destroyed. Well, what happens in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. We need to be mindful. We need to be watching. We need to be sober. We need to be aware of what's going on, what's going on around us and not just get ourselves off living off in some utopia land and just living away and not caring, not having a care in the world about anything. No, we need to care about what's going on. We need to care most, first and foremost, about other people and their souls going out. We, we need to care about people. We need to get involved. We need to work. We need to do something that's not just for our benefit. It's not just for us to go, yeah, I'm going to go buy some property and just go live off the land and isolate myself and live by myself and not have any dealings with anybody else, not go to the store, not have, you know, I'm just going to go and be by myself or with my small group or with my small community. That's how the fools live. Because there's a lot more to life than just existing and eat, drink, and marry. For tomorrow we die. Well, in this case, that's true. If they think they got everything figured out, peace and safety, then comes destruction. We need to understand that this world has fallen and that the people, that people are not inherently good also. These people doesn't look like they had very many defenses. They were kind of just, just living their life. So yeah, we're, we're living quietly, secure, whatever. They've, they've got whatever going on. But they weren't ready to defend themselves. And, you know, in the world that we live in, you need to make sure that you are ready to defend yourself. Turn to Luke chapter 22. And it's right to defend yourself. When, you're, when, you're, um, when your life is threatened. And the Bible teaches that. Now, we need to have a good understanding. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail tonight, but I just want to touch on this real quick. You know, the Bible talks about turning your other cheek. You know, when someone smites you on the one cheek, turn the other one. And this is talking about, you know, loving your enemies and blessing those that curse you and doing good to those that hate you, right? And you have to... 
obviously receive and believe that teaching on being able to do good to others, but at the same time, if somebody is threatening your life and going to kill you or someone's breaking into your house at night, you know, you have every right and responsibility, especially if you're a man of a household, to protect your family, to protect innocent people, and to stop threats that come your way. The Bible says in Luke chapter 22, we're going to get this right from Jesus' mouth of what he told his disciples to do. Luke 22, verse 35, And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. So he's reminding them, when Jesus Christ was sending him out to preach the gospel, he's sending him out two and two, and he's saying, you know, go into this city, go into that place, preach over there. And he says, don't take a purse. So basically, you don't need to take any money with you. <clears throat> you don't need to take any shoes. You don't need to take anything to provide for yourself. Why? Because he was going to make sure they were taken care of anywhere they went. And he was teaching them just to be faithful and to listen and to obey what he said. And they listened to what he said, and he said, well, did you lack anything when I told you just to go and just not have anything for yourself? I was like, nope, we had everything we needed. People took him in, they fed him. Everybody else made sure that they were taken care of when they obeyed Jesus Christ and what he told them to do. So first and foremost, that teaches, yeah, of course, we need to be relying on God first for everything. Put our faith and trust in God. God can take care of us no matter what. Especially when God is with you. Verse number 36. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. He's warning them and telling them, okay, he, he's, he's letting them know the time's coming now that th these scriptures are going to be fulfilled and I'm going to go. And I'm going to be crucified and I'm not going to be with you anymore. When Jesus Christ is with them, they've got nothing to worry about, nothing to fear. Jesus sends them out and they're just going to listen and do everything. He says, and now, no matter what, you're going to do whatever Jesus says. But basically he's saying, I'm going to be gone from this world now. I'm going to leave here. So as a result, I'm not going to send you out anymore without the means to take care of yourself. You're going to need to take care of yourself. You're going to need to bring your purse. You're going to need to bring your ship. And he says, you know what? If you don't have a sword, go sell your garment and buy one. He says, I'd rather have you have that protection for yourself of, in a sword than having a garment to protect your skin. He's saying, you, you know, this is more important. Make sure you have one of these. And they said, well, look, we've got two swords. He's like, that's fine. That's enough. But he's instructing his disciples because he's leaving that they need to be prepared and ready. And what's the sword for? It's not to slice bread. It's not to slice cold cuts. He, he, didn't, he didn't want them to have a sword because he would just use a knife for those things, right? A sword is for, is for nothing else but for their own self-defense. That's why he's telling them to do that. And you know what? Jesus Christ hasn't come back yet. When Jesus Christ rules and reigns on this earth, you know what? We're not going to need guns. We're not going to need knives. We're not going to need that stuff at all because Jesus is going to be ruling and reigning. He's going to be right here with us. But you know what? Right now, I believe just like as the disciples, he's saying, you know what? Be prepared. You should have some money on you. You should, you should be ready to take care of yourself and you should be armed and ready to protect yourself if you have to. Now, of course, the, the weapons of the warfare that we're engaged in are not physical ones. It is a spiritual battle, but at the same time, we need to be able to defend ourselves against these threats. Why? Because we want to keep on fighting the spiritual fight. And it's a dangerous world that, that we live in. And these, these hippie utopias are, are fantasy land. I knew someone that, that just basically didn't say didn't like guns. And that's fine. You don't, have to, you don't have to like them, right? 
You say, well, the world would be better without him. Okay, maybe, but that doesn't change any facts. And you're never going to get rid of them all. It's just not going to happen. There's always going to be people that have them. So it's there's, there's just impossible to say, you know, so that's the world that we live in. That's reality. So as a result, you know what? I'm going to make sure I'm armed. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if there's just no weapons anywhere for anyone to, like, hurt someone else? That sounds like it would be pretty good, but it's just not reality. It's not the way things are. One day there will be peace. Again, when God's the king, when God's sitting on the throne and, and ruling over this world, absolutely. But that's not where we are right now. So until then, we ought to make sure that we're prepared. Let's go back to Judges chapter number 18. Verse number 8, it says, And they came unto their brethren to Zorah and Eshdaal, and their brethren said unto them, What say ye? And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And are ye still? Be not slothful to go and to enter to possess the land. When ye go, ye shall come unto a people secure and to a large land, for God hath given it into your hands, a place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. So basically the spies come back, the five people that went out and tell them, this is great. I mean, there is just this awesome land there and, and there is no want of anything there. This is great. So don't be slack. Don't be lazy. Get yourselves up there now and, and let's take that city because we're, you know, God's given us this land. It's our inheritance. Let's go get it. And then in verse number 11, it says, And there went from thence of the family of the Danites out of Zor and out of Eshdaal 600 men appointed with weapons of war. And they went up and pitched in Kirjath Jerim in Judah. Wherefore they called that place Mahanadan unto this day. Behold, it is behind Kirjath Jerim. And they passed thence unto Mount Ephraim and came unto the house of Micah. So now, you know, those first five spies, when they came there, they saw the, the Levite and they, they talked with him and they saw Micah's house and everything. And now the rest of the troops are coming because now they're ready to battle. They've got a plan. They, they know they can take it. They've got the confidence. And there's 600 soldiers with these five guys that have come back. And they've, they're, they're back in the same place and they're at the house of Micah. Verse number 14. Then answered the five men that went to spy out the country of Laish and said unto their brethren, Do ye know that there is in these houses an ephod and teraphim and a graven image and a molten image? Now therefore consider what ye have to do. So the, the five spies that were there previously are just letting everyone, Hey, do you know what, you know what he, this guy's got here? And he lists off all the, all the things here, the graven image, the molten image, the ephod, the teraphim. And he's saying, now guess what we've got to do. Verse number 15. And they turned thitherward and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even unto the house of Micah, and saluted him. So they greet the, the priest. Verse 16 says, And the 600 men appointed with their weapons of war, which were of the children of Dan, stood by the entering of the gate. So the soldiers are standing outside of the gate. They're, they're kind of hanging out out front. But the five spies that went earlier they go in, verse 17, and the five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither and took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with weapons of war. So those five spies just go back in and they just, they just take what they want. They just go in and steal. Now, there's a lot of things recorded in the Bible, but it doesn't make everything that these people do right. See, God is giving them this inheritance, yes, but it's not, God already has, has told them it's not because they're so great. God's not even doing this because they're so great, because they're such a great people. He's doing it to fulfill a promise and to bring judgment upon an even more wicked people that, that needed to be destroyed. So God brings this people in and yeah, this is a whole group of thieves and they're stealing stuff that they shouldn't even have anyways. I mean, they're stealing idols and teraphim and, you know, all this stuff that this guy had. They just go in and just take it. And, um, 
it says here in verse 18, and these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod and the teraphim, the molten image. Then said the priest unto them, what do ye? So the priest is like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> Why are you just taking this stuff? Verse 19, and they said unto him, hold thy peace. Lay thine hand upon thy mouth and go with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man or that thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel? So basically they're telling this guy, hey, shut your mouth if you know what's good for you. And instead, why don't you just come with us? So they've just taken this guy's, you know, all of his, his superstition just unto himself. So instead of one man having it, saying, well, isn't it just better? I mean, instead of just having one guy here for you to be a priest to, why don't you just come and be it? And look, at they, they use the same phrases, the, the same terminology, be a father unto us. Be a father and priest. They believe the same things that Micah did. And then it says, verse 20, and the priest's heart was glad. Oh, I'm happy now. I, he, this hypocrite is just serving as this father and this priest to Micah. These guys come in and just steal from them. I mean, it, I, I think they're just trying to break all of the Ten Commandments as much as they possibly can at once and testing this priest. And this priest is, again, just like, you know, we saw a picture of the end times with the, the heathen being just careless and, and when they say peace and safety, then cometh utter destruction. This is the priest. This is like the priest of the land. That's going to, that's gonna, uh, the people are going to heap themselves teachers having itching ears. The people just want to hear good and, and not hear anything bad, not hear anything evil, not hear what they're doing is sin. They just, they just want to hear somebody, you know, tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear and make merchandise of them. Because all he care, cares about here is just, wow, he's glad. Wow. Oh, you're going to, I could be a, a father to all you and then I'll get even more money because there's so many more people, Right. And he, and he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of the people. So now he's partaking in their, in their, thiev their thievery. He's saying, okay, yeah, can't, that's a good idea. Let's go. All right, we're, we're going on now. Forget it, nuts to Micah. I don't know about that guy anyways. I mean, a guy hired him to do this stuff and now he's just like, yeah, let's go. This is what you get when you deal with superstitious religiosity. It's not genuine. There's no integrity. There, there's no real moral. There's no real reliance on the word of God as an absolute. It's just, hey, when something better comes along, when a better gate comes along, I'm going to jump on that boat. I'm going to go with them. I'm going to follow a multitude to do evil. Why? Because there is no, just this is right and this is wrong. He wasn't willing to make that stand. But see, Micah kind of brought that on himself from the beginning because he's hiring a guy that didn't have any integrity to the word of God, who is supposed to be a man of God, who's supposed to be a servant of the Lord. But just in taking the job with Micah demonstrates that the word of God isn't that important. And it's amazing how these people think because I think they honestly think that it's going to do them good. I think Micah was genuine, genuinely thinking that it was going to do him good in the sight of the idol that he made for himself that he had this Levite to be this priest unto him without even bothering to think, well, how can this be good if the guy's not even serving the Lord at all based on what the Bible says? And, and you think that somehow he's going to do you good? That's not a man of God. If you want a man of God to do you good, then find one who actually believes the book. But that's not what they're interested in at all, and they know what the answer is going to be anyways. It's, it's like the, when the kings, like when Ahab and when, when these other wicked kings are going to find somebody, when they're drawing, going to seek counsel of the Lord, right? And they're asking all these false prophets, hey, what does the Lord say? Should we go up? Yeah, go up, man. God, you, God's got this. You're great. You know, God bless you. You're going to win. There's no way you can lose. They don't want to hear from Elijah. They don't want to hear from the real prophets that are going to tell them the truth, that aren't going to just try to tickle their ears and, and tell them something nice and friendly so that maybe they can get some kickback 
for, for telling them what they want to hear. Because Elijah didn't hold back. And he says, nope, you're going you're gonna to get killed in this battle. And that's exactly what happened at, when Ahab and Jehoshaphat were going up to fight. And Ahab was, was trying to find someone. And they called on, on Elijah and they sent Elijah into prison. He's like, he's like, well, when I come back in peace, you know, then we'll take care of this. And he's like, you're not, if you come back in peace, then, then God hasn't spoken by me because you're going to die. And that's exactly what happened. He died and the dogs licked his blood just as was prophesied because he stole the, the vineyard of Naboth. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. I don't want to get off on that story. I don't know how I even started getting, getting, <laughs> getting that far off. But this is, this is what these people do, you know, that, that are into all the superstition. And you got to watch out for that because no, when there is no foundation, you're on shifting sand. And you're going you're gonna to move with the times and you're going to move with the culture and you're going to move with whatever and not actually have a solid stand on what's right and what's wrong. And I don't know about you, but I want to surround myself with people who have integrity according to God's word and that are going to be unmovable and steadfast in God's word. Because at least you know what you're going to get with them. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 21. So they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle and the carriage before them. Now they do this because they know that it's very possible that the fight's going to come. So they're putting their weaker, you know, their children and their goods and their cattle and stuff before them and, and making sure that they're out of the way because if there's going to be a fight coming from Micah's house, it's going to be coming from the rear because they're, they're departing from Micah's house. So they're just preparing themselves for what's going to come, which, which does end up coming. Look at verse 22. And when they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth thee that thou comest with such a company? So basically, Micah and all his neighbors and his household, probably relatives, I would imagine, all kind of living close by, they hear about these guys coming in and stealing stuff. So they, they gather their own force, however many people they could gather up together to go meet these people and try to get their stuff back. And they're like, what are you doing? And, 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 and they turn around and they're like, oh, what's, what's your problem? What aileth thee, right? What's wrong with you? That you bring such a company. Well, why are you bringing so many people here, Micah? Huh? What's wrong with you? Verse 24, and he said, you have taken away my gods which I made and the priest, and ye are gone away, and what have I more? And what is this that you say unto me, what aileth thee? He's like, you've taken my gods. You've taken my priest. Now, what a, what a foolish, silly thing to say anyways. You've taken my gods. Wow. That's a pretty powerful god you got there where someone could just go along and just steal your god. How, how does this not get through their head? You call that a god? Look, if a God can just be stolen from you, that's not God. And why in the world would you want to worship something that can just be stolen from you? People do it all the time. All the time. And again, you know, the references to the Catholic Church are just amazing. When you think about people who bow down and worship statues. And I've seen shrines and, th you know, uh, statues of Mary surrounded by flowers and everything else out in, on people's front yards. I mean, imagine someone just going up and stealing that stuff. And someone probably, people probably do. It probably <laughs> happens. I don't know how often, but I mean, you've got so many people that are into that. And, and people put some real fancy stuff I've seen outside, you know, real, real intricate artwork. You know, the, the, the gravings is like real fine and, and painted and whatever. I've seen it really done up before, right? Where obviously someone spent a lot of money or time or whatever making these, these images, these idols. And someone going and stealing some dumb idol. And going, oh, you stole, you stole the mother of God. No, no, it's just a rock. It's just 
silver or gold or metal or wood, whatever. That's all it is. But this is what gets him so upset. You know, you, you took my gods and my priest. The priest went willingly, buddy. <laughs> he ditched you. You've taken away my gods, which, which, which I made. So not only have they taken away, he's like, I made my gods. You took them away from me. What? I mean, man. It is, it is funny. I, I, it is funny, but the sad part is, is that this is a real story. Yeah. This is a real guy. This really happened. There's a guy that used his hands, and he's not the only one, that has used his own hands to make his own gods. And he's upset when someone comes along and steals his gods. It's no wonder that this makes God so angry. Imagine being God. And someone else thinking that you are like this, this thing that someone made with his hands. Right. Like, hey, here's a picture of, of God. And it's just some whatever. Human, animal, beast, you know, fish, bird, whatever thing he makes. Or creature, whatever, whatever he makes. Yeah, that's God. Not even close. Right. Take away my gods which I made. And the priest, and you're gone away. And what have I more? And what is this that you say to me? What ails me? Like, what do you think's wrong with me? <laughs> Verse 25. And the children of Dan said unto him, Let not thy voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon thee, and thou lose thy life with the lives of thy household. So basically, he's saying, You better watch your mouth, because, you know, some of us in our group might get a little angry with you and not want to hear you anymore and go and kill you. Now look, both people here are wrong. But this is a story that actually happened that the Bible records. I mean, these, these children of Dan, they shouldn't, you shouldn't just go and just steal. And, and this, is, this is Micah. I mean, he's one of the children of Israel too. He's living in Mount Ephraim. He's, you know, he's, he's an Ephraimite. One of their brethren, supposedly. And they're just going and, and stealing from them. They're, they're, they're not righteous. They're not right. And neither, neither is Micah. Let's keep reading here. It says, um, verse 26, And the children of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back unto his house. So basically, Micah realizes he's not going to win this fight, so he turns around and goes home. Verse 27, and they took the things which Micah had made and the priest which he had and came to La unto Laish, unto a people that were at quiet and secure, and they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Zidon, and they had no business with any man. And it was in the valley that lieth by Beth Rehob, and they built a city and dwelt therein. So basically, they're saying, you know, they were just sitting ducks. They were sitting targets because they had isolated themselves. And not only were they already pretty far away from, from the Zidonians, they also didn't even do business with them. So it's not like they had people from out of town there that would be able to leave, you know, flee and go and tell them, hey, this is what happened to the town that anyone would even care about because no one's doing business. See, when people are doing business with you, you're going to be like, well, you're, now you're ruining my finances and you're going to go and maybe try to defend them and help them out because, you know, at, at, if nothing else, financially, you're going to be, you're going to be hurt by these people not being there anymore. But... They were so far removed from everybody that they ended up just getting destroyed with, with no one else finding out about it, really. Verse number 29. And they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan their father, who was born unto Israel, howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. So the, ho the whole time, now, now obviously this closes out the chapter, but turn real quick to 1 Kings chapter 12. Because I just want to point this out to you. 
So the children of Dan, they take Micah's image. And it's going to show you, too, the, the, the ramifications and the fallout of one man's sins. This guy, Micah, that, that created himself, he made these gods. These gods that he made with his hands now have gone into Dan and are in Dan like for the entire time the children of Israel are just, are here. And it says the whole time that the house of the Lord is in Shiloh. So God's house is in Shiloh, but you know what? The people of Dan don't care about that. They've got their own priests. They've got their own gods. They're doing their own thing in their land, and now they're going to live just as carelessly as the people that were there before them. They set up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Look at verse uh, 28 of 1 Kings chapter number 12. Because we see here that their idolatry was reinforced with Jeroboam. Jeroboam, the, the son of Nebat, was the king of Israel that when, um, after Solomon had sinned and God was going to split Israel into two nations in the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, reigned. And then Jeroboam rose up basically and split off from the house of David and all Israel with them, essentially. And that's when the two kingdoms began. And then, and, and God ordained Jeroboam to be king. And he sent a prophet to him and said, look, if you can follow in my ways, if you know, God just looking for someone that will obey him, looking for someone that's willing to follow him. You know, David had a good heart before the Lord and he was willing to follow him. And, and Abraham had a good heart. He was willing to follow him. And God's looking for these people, these men to just say, look, just follow me and I'll take care of you and you'll get all these blessings. But what happened with Jeroboam? He became afraid. He, he liked the power and decided that he was going to take matters in his own hands instead of trusting the Lord. He says, well, hold on a second now. I mean, the house of God is in, is in Judah. It's in Jerusalem. So if the people start going there, their hearts are going to be moved back towards the house of David. And then where am I going to be? They're going to kill me. They're going to, you know, he didn't trust in the word of the Lord, which told him, which promised him, hey, if you do right, I'm going to establish you. You are going to be established and you are going to be set up and have these blessings and, and everything else. It says in verse number 28, it says, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So instead of them going to Jerusalem, he says, No, 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 we're just going to set up gods here. Don't go off into Jerusalem. Just stay right here in the land of Egypt. It says in verse 29, and he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Yeah, Dan was a very convenient place to put this idol because it was already filled with a bunch of idol worshipers. So they're not going to reject it and go, no, no, don't put that thing here, right? They're not going to say, get this idolatry out of here. No, he chose places where, okay, great, Hey, cool, now we've got another idol. Okay, here's our gods. Let's put this one right next to Micah's god. <laughs> and then we get another one and another one and another one. And then when someone comes against us, we'll have more gods than they have. And then we'll really beat them. And this is the, the mindset. Verse 30 says, And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. So it was that the one in Dan that really stuck. Because he made two to try to make it convenient for everybody in Israel to be able to just stay put in Israel and not go off to Jerusalem. But he says, Everybody went unto Dan. Verse 31, And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And again, you already had people in Dan making priests unto themselves. You already had all of this stuff taking place. Well, this was however long before, you know, I, who knows, 100 years maybe, when, when this stuff happened, 200 years, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say exactly how long before these events are taking place. This isn't very long into the reign of the kings, though. 
So you've got Saul and David and Solomon. So yeah, probably a, probably a couple, two or three, maybe 300 years, a few hundred years. I'm just you know, doing some math in my head right now, but 40 years, 40 years, Solomon, you know. But um, when you see all of this, this, this is just a thought. This is not proof. I mean, a lot of people have done a lot of wicked things in the Bible, right? But I've always kind of wondered in Revelation chapter 7 when it lists off the, the tribes that are, that are the 144,000, right? And it's 12,000 of this tribe and 12,000 of that tribe. It lists off all these tribes. Dan's not mentioned in, in those tribes. And I can't help but wonder if this might be the reason why. Is that just for, I mean, the name of the, of the city, Dan, was named after Dan, their father, started off right off the bat in idolatry and was involved in the idolatry all the way up until the, uh, the carrying away into Egypt. It lasted the entire time. What do you see in Romans chapter 1? When someone uh, becomes reprobate, when they reject the Lord, they change the truth of God into a lie and they worship and serve the creature more than the creator is blessed forever. Amen. Idolatry is just, I mean, it's, it's tied in so closely with the reprobate. It's, and you go throughout scripture, you see that connection over and over and over and over again. It just makes me wonder if Dan just kind of in, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense, right? I'm not saying everybody in Dan was reprobate. I'm just saying in a broad sense that Dan just was just became reprobate and turned themselves over unto idolatry and was just that tribe that's left out and not and, and not being recognized in the end times because they had just gone down that path and they just stayed down that path uh, until the captivity. And after the captivity, you know, who, who knows if the, if the tribe of Dan even really continued to exist because they had been then intermingled and, and whatever, right? Who, don't know. I, I'm just conjecturing. But uh, just a little food for thought. I'm not saying that that's the reason why. It's just something that, came, that just comes to my mind, especially when you, when you get this understanding. And you know what? You really don't read a lot about Dan in the Bible at all. Dan's hardly mentioned in the Bible. It's just one of those tribes that... And... and Kind of see why. Here. Let's bow our eyes. I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the great truths and wisdom that we could, we could learn from your words. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to be better students of the Bible. I pray that you please open up our understanding. Lord, give us more knowledge. Help us just to, to really carefully read your words and, and try to understand everything. And open up our understanding, Lord. Help us to just grow and to also be able to teach others. Lord, uh, we love you and, and uh, help us to just be pleasing in your sights. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.